that was easy. Hi, so I was recently sent this video and the creator of the video apparently is Werner Hartel. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. And it was, it appears to be about Cantor's diagonal um, argument of showing that there are some sets that are uncountably infinite in size. And the only comment on the person who sent this to me was lol. <laughs> So maybe so what we'll see is maybe something inherently wrong and the dislike ratio is not looking too good according to this but remember that dislike ratios mean absolutely nothing. Um, I'm happy to note that most of my videos are high high percentage liked but I don't really mind that whether they're high or low. I just care about getting the right information out. Okay, so let's Go ahead and watch this, and I'll periodically stop halfway through. Today I'm going to discuss Cantor's diagonal argument, which attempts to prove a set is uncountable by proving the assumption it is countable leads to a contradiction. Okay, so the basic idea is that a countable set is just something that you can list out in some particular order, and uncountable means that you can't do that. And the usual style of argument is that you um, you start out with a set that you suppose is countable and you want to prove uncountable, and then you derive some kind of contradiction later. Okay, so let's see what, where he goes. And the way that proceeds is as follows. To begin with, you assume some set T with elements S1, S2, where you want to prove that this set is uncountable. Uh, okay, so we're already uh, going off the rails here. So, uh, may, is he proving this in the general case? It seems kind of like it, but um, we don't know what the S1 and S2 elements are. So, are we proving that T is an uncountable set here? Um, or, I'm not sure what's actually happening here. Okay, so... We're assuming that T is a countable set. So I'm assuming that that means that the S1, S2, et cetera, is the enumeration of it. Okay, so let's see. So you begin by assuming the set T is countable, which means it's an enumerable set, which means that you can list it. So the next step is to list all the elements of T, and then finally show there is a member. Okay, so... Step two here, um, the idea is good, but it's not written right. So it says list all elements of T. That is literally impossible to do, uh, assuming that the set is infinite. If the set is finite, then it's countable by definition. You just list out the things. But if it's infinite, you literally can't list them all. <laughs> but the idea of what countable means is that pick any element that you want in the set, any one that you wish, if you go through this enumeration, S1, S2, etc., you eventually will hit your element that you picked. So no matter which one that you pick, you will hit it eventually. It may take a while, but it, you'll eventually hit it. You can't list all of the elements. You can, you can be guaranteed to pick any particular element that it will be listed, but you can't list them all because that, there will be infinitely many things in there. All right, so let's see. Show that there's a member of D... Uh, there's a member D of T, which is not in the list L. So, well, L is not listed anywhere, okay? Um, so, which is not in the list L. There's no list L to find. So, I'm assuming L is S1, S2, etc., but it's not at all clear at all. <laughs> all right. D of T, which is not in... The list arriving at a contradiction you assume all the members of t in the, are in the list then you show there's a member of the list which is an np so you want to so you're not assuming that the the elements of t are in the list you have to define the list first so the t is a set which has no order you need to actually make something that has an order in order to define what the first element is etc and you're assuming that T is countable here, so you can assume that there is a specific ordering S1, S2, etc. Um, but there's no mention of that here, but let's see. Find a D such that D is not in the list, 
when P is in T. For example, yeah. So, so that that's the basic uh, idea behind count, Cantor's diagonalization. Oh my God, we're only a minute in, and I'm making so many comments. Uh, yeah. So the proof of diagonalization is that the list cannot be complete because you, um, if you can find some element that's in that is not in the listing, that is supposedly the listing of T, but is in T nonetheless then the listing is incomplete. And so therefore the, there's a contradiction there because if you can find some element in T, then that means that the listing will eventually find it, but it's not in the listing at all. So therefore it's a contradiction. So let's see where he goes. For example, I'm going to, if I take the set T is equal to these three sequences, then I'm going to assume, I want to prove they're uncountable. So the first step is list them. But that's a finite set. <laughs> okay, well, let's see. Assume they're countable. So here's, the, here's the, the, the list of these three members of T. And then... So it seems like he didn't... Uh, he, he's either struggling with this or hasn't practiced this enough. Um, I would recommend that he practice this more. I'm going to cre cre create a member D or a sequence D, which is not in this list. And the way I'm going to do that is the first digit of D is going to be the opposite of the first digit of S1. The second digit of D is going to be the opposite of the second di digit of S2. And the third digit of D is going to be the opposite of the third digit of S3. So yeah, so, so that's the basic idea behind Cantor's diagonalization proof. Um, where you list out the, you put the listing in, in the, in each of the rows. So the rows here are representing each of the elements of T. So one, zero, one, you can see is the first row, zero, one, zero is the second row, etc. And what you do to make a new element is you go along the diagonal. It doesn't have to be that particular diagonal, but, um, some kind of diagonal, where you hit every single row once and every column once, uh, or, or uh, you hit every row, that's at least once. Um, and what you do is wherever you hit the row, you in that same position downstairs, you, f you change the entry to be something else. So I'm assuming here, which is not <laughs> made in advance, that the alphabet here is zeros and ones, which it appears to be in all these cases. Um, so that's why it's changing the zeros to ones and one to zeros and everything. Uh, but this should not give a contradiction here, but let's see how he proceeds. Oops, I went for 10 seconds. That D, I've created an element D, which is not in the list. So. However, D001 is also, I satisfied this condition, D is not in the list, but D001 is also not in T, the set T, so therefore I have... Oh, God. No, no, no. <laughs> so, just because that it fails the condition of, what, of D not being an L, in D not being in T does not give the contradiction. So D is not in T, uh, that does not imply that it is uncountable. It could be countable, it could be uncountable. This proves nothing about the set T here. I haven't satisfied both conditions and I wasn't able to create a contradiction to the assumption these are uncountable, therefore, this is countable. No, that is not true. So just because that you can uh, find a specific example, some specific diagonal and some specific ordering that uh, fails the the D in L and the D in the in T condition, that does not mean that the set is ca is countable. The only reason that it's countable in this case is that it's a finite set. If it's a finite set, by definition, it's a countable set. It's purely by definition here. So, and in fact, the next example is going to have exactly the same re and the third example is going to have the exact same reasoning because they're all finite sets. Just because it's a finite set, uh, you're going to fail the D not in T question 
because you went down the whole diagonal and you constructed the element. And it's different than every other element in the thing, and the set's finite, so you must be different than everything in the finite set. And so therefore, you can't be in the set to start with because there's only a finite set. Oh my god. Okay, let's see. Now, I've gone through a couple other examples here. I've taken the set T is 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. Then I've listed the members of T, which is here. Then I've created the, the diagonal element D by taking the first digit opposite to this digit, this digit opposite to that digit on the diagonal. And those are the only diagonal elements in this list. Uh, there are no more diagonal elements. So I'll just, for the third digit of x, I will simply uh, take an arbitrary value x. This condition D is... Uh, oops, I went, I went around there. So... Jesus, take the wheel, please. Um, <laughs> sorry. So, if X, if you pick an arbitrary element, you're still not in the set T. That does not help you whatsoever here. Okay. Uh, obviously, is not in the list. It's not in one or two. Okay, so it's going to have the same contradiction. I'm going to. I'm just going to skip forward. It's, it's going to be. It's going to be the exact same thing in all of these cases. From, I wasn't able to eliminate B from the list, and indeed B does show up in the list. Yeah. Okay. So uh, he has more elements than the maximum length of the string in there, but that's not an. It doesn't make a difference because all of the strings are. Uh, it's a finite set, and a problem with actually his approach is if he picks a set which has unequal lengths of strings, then you're gonna have some issue somewhere because in the shorter length string row, what are you gonna put in the last entry? You can't put anything. And actually, none of these are gonna work because uh, no matter what uh, subset of strings that you pick, so if we pick strings, which are all finite length, then no matter what you do, that set is countable because it's a subset of a countable set. Any subset of a countable thing is countable. And there's a whole theorem behind that, but uh, just take my word on that for now. Any subset of a, finite, of a countable set is countable. And the set of all strings over zeros and ones is countable. The sigma star is countable because you can list them out in, in order, in less graphic order, but it doesn't really matter. These are all subsets of sigma star, so therefore they're all countable. What makes counter what makes Cantor's proof important is that the lengths of the elements are infinite themselves. So we consider them words, which can be infinite in length, so infinite sequences of characters. But they're not strings; they're infinite sequences or words. You can think of them like a real number, which ha has an infinite decimal expansion, where these have a finite length expansion. So if you have anything that has finite length involved here, either you have to extend it out in some way, like with real numbers, you can always add zeros at the end or the beginning. It doesn't actually matter which way you go. But here with strings, it does matter, because if you add zeros at the end, that's going to be a different string. It's not like with a real number, you can put a zero on the end. That doesn't change the value of the number. It's a different looking number, but it's the same value. So all of these approaches are not going to work because it's a subset of a countable set. Over here, so that D is in the list and don't satisfy that condition. It turns out that in this case, D is in the list. Now, it's interesting if I, if I change the order of the list, the one, zero, zero, one, 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 and it, I get a different D. Same procedure, give me a D equals zero, zero. Now in this case... Yeah, you get a different string by investigating the elements in a different order, but that's not the point of the proof. The point of the proof is to show that this thing is uncountable. It doesn't matter what the thing you get at the end is, as long as you get an element that's in the set T but not in the listing L, that is what's important. It doesn't matter what the element is. It never matters what the element is. In fact, one very important point, actually we're going to talk about this in a second, is that you cannot assume the ordering of the elements. 
So uh, look at the right uh, section here where he has like the T equals S1, S2, S3 with, I think, DC? DC? With 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, and then going down the diagonals over there with the circled entries. You cannot assume those entries because if you assume those entries, then it may not be possible to enumerate those elements. In fact, how do you get to S5 from S4? What's the ordering here? You do not know what the ordering is in advance. You assume the ordering, but you don't know exactly what the elements themselves are. You can assume the ordering and then say, okay, the ith digit of the jth number, I'm gonna denote by S, I, J, or whatever. And then the new number DC at position J is going to be the opposite of whatever SIJ was or SJJ was for all J or something. But here you cannot assume the values of the elements in the enumeration in this uh, 2D table here. D is not, I found the D not in the list. However, D is also not in T, so I haven't satisfied both of these conditions. Again, not relevant. The set of I'm all skip forward. infinite binary sequences. Okay, now you're talking about infinite binary sequences. So this is different. This will get you an uncountable proof if you don't assume the values of the elements in the, in the uh, listing here. And the objective is to show that this set of all infinite binary sequences is uncountable. And the way that is done is by assuming that all of the members of this set T are countable. So, oh, okay, that's wrong. So you can So elements themselves are always countable. Every element is countable because it, it, actually even that's wrong. Oh my god. So sets are countable. Elements cannot be countable. Because they're not set, well, unless you're talking about a set of sets. But here, we don't know that they're sets. So we don't know whether S1 itself, itself is countable. The set may or may not be countable. Okay, We're trying to prove that T is uncountable, but it's, we have yet to prove that, of course. But an element cannot be by itself uh, countable. If you have the set containing one element, that's a finite set, and so therefore is countable. But um, an element by itself, not as a set, cannot be countable. I write, for example, S1, S2, S3, S4, and so on. Then I construct the diagonal sequence D in the same manner where the first, the first digit of S1 is changed to the first to become one. In DC, the second digit of S2 is changed to become 1 in DC, and so on down the line. Now, the argument is that I've constructed a D which is nowhere in the list, so I've satisfied this condition. On the other hand, the way I, I construct a D is as an infinite binary sequence, and so therefore it's in, the, it's in T, it's in the original set. I really got to get a cane for uh, tapping the screen like that. I, I thought that was kind of funny. So I arrived at a contradiction by assuming T was uncountable. By assuming D was countable, therefore, the conclusion is T is uncountable. You, you got to be a little bit more explicit than that. It, it's right. There, it's, it's right in the sense... Uh, getting away from the problems that we talked about before about like the you can't assume the elements and etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, the you need to be more explicit about why the element d c or whatever it is is not in the listing and the reason why it's not in the listing is wherever which consider any element in the collection like si so for any si then the position at uh, at its ith position, so going along the diagonal, it must be different than the ith position of the D sequence. And so because it's different in one position at least, therefore SI is not equal to the D element. And so therefore D is not equal to S of I because it's different in one place. But that's true of every element in the sequence S1, S2, etc. 
And so therefore, D cannot be equal to any of them. And since, be, and since uh, we're assuming that L is the whole listing of the elements of T, that means that D needs to appear in that collection, but it can't because it's different than every other one. And so therefore, uh, it, it is in T because that's how we define T, uh, but it can't be in the listing because it's different than every other element in the listing. But the problem is I was a little la lax in, in how I described what, 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 where D fit in. For any, what, what I can, what I really have shown is that for any sequence in the list, B sub C is not in the list up to that sequence. What? I'm not sure what that means. DC is not in the list up to that sequence. How do you know that? It could very well be that DC is equal to some SI for every position up to the ith uh, position where it's different in the one place and equal afterward. That is totally possible. Um, it's, it's, it, that's entirely possible. Uh, you can't assume that because you can't assume the elements in the, in the enumeration here. You can't show, and what I haven't show, shown, is that it is nowhere in the list after that sequence. So I, and this conclusion, P sub C is unequal to L, is not really valid as so far, but I can't ever show, arrive at this, the only way I can arrive at this conclusion that it's valid for the entire list is if the list is square. But the list- The list is square? I have no idea what that means. It's never square because there are more elements than there are digits in the element. So for example, for three digits, I have three digits give rise to eight, eight sequences. So if I, if I take three digits, this eight sequences are zero, 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 one, zero, zero, and so on down the line. So three digits give rise to eight sequences. So in this case- You actually wrote zero, one, one twice. That's kind of funny. The list is not square. So if I try, if I if I try to work with this list and create a diagonal, the diagonal element D, I'd be able to create the first. Oh, okay. I think I know what he's trying to say. So he's saying like the if we go back. So if you look at the third example that in the middle part where he had more elements than columns, so more rows than columns, and basically you had to stop halfway. The problem is that this, the, and he's concluding that uh, because the list is not square, therefore you're gonna have the same issue with the infinite guy. The problem is it's infinite. And so there's no actual end here. If there was an end, he'd be right, but there's no actual end. And so you can't actually claim that uh, because there could be some weight element way down that is equal to the D element in all but the one place where it has to be different. But you don't actually know that because the list is infinite and you can't assume the elements of the collection in the enumeration. Oh my God. I have three digits, one, zero, zero, and so on down the line. So three digits give rise to eight sequences. So in this case, the list is not square. So if I try, if I, if I try to place- I think we solved that. But then I can't go any further because my diagonal elements end over here. Now, this really is academic in a sense because it can easily be shown that this list with the uncountable element is really countable. I'm not even going to address that. And that's the important point, that the list with the uncountable element is countable. And the way I can show that is if I list the, the uncountable element here, uh, 110, 110, 11, then I list S1, S2, S3, and S4, then I can use a standard diagonal counting procedure for a, an infinite binary array which proceeds as follows. You start with this element, go down to here, and walk to here, across to that element, diagonal. Okay, so if you haven't seen this, where he does the, the diagonal thing, 
that is a standard technique to show that the rational numbers are countable. And that is true, that the rational numbers are countable. And the way that you do that is you have the rows be the, the let, let's just say positive rationals, just to be easy. So then the rows are going to be, or the horizontal axis is going to be the integers, the positive integers, and the vertical axis is going to be also be positive integers. And then what you do is you uh, go along this diagonal back diagonal thing over and over and over, and what you do is at the i of jth position, that's encoding the, um, the rational number i over j. Okay, And so any positive rational number is some integer over some integer, and so that's some, some, uh, some distance along the horizontal axis and some distance along the vertical axis. And so any rational number that you can think of, you're going to hit that element at some point because it's just some integer divided by some other integer. And you can actually think of it like the back diagonals are going up one in value and the value associated with i and j is i plus j. So i plus j is just some finite value. And if you start at zero and add one over and over and over, you're going to hit that eventually. And so if you think of any uh, positive rational number, it must be of that form. And so therefore you must hit it at some point. The problem with this though, is that this is an infinite sequence. In, in, in the sense that uh, D is an infinite sequence, S is an infinite sequence, etc. But besides the fact that you can't actually freaking know what the uh, numeration actually is in the first place, but getting that aside, uh, assuming that we do know the enumeration of the things, um, this would work if we can access the last thing, but we can't actually access the last thing. And so what does enumeration mean? That means we need to be able to get any element that you're thinking of. We need to, in a finite amount of time, be able to print that thing. But in order to get each of the elements here, we need to go infinitely far because each of these sequences is infinitely long here by definition. So that's the, the main problem here. And I'm not sure if he's going to actually get out of it, but let's see. Any then diagonally up to there, across to there, and so on throughout the entire array, which doesn't have to be squared in order to be countable. We, 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 no. So you can always investigate a finite piece of it. So for any element, for any finite piece, we need we can actually get the that particular digit by this procedure. But the problem is that the enumeration actually has to output the whole element all at once at some point. But we can never get to the end because there is no end of any of these sequences. And so that's the main issue here. It can be rectangular, it can be infinite, it can be finite, it doesn't matter. <sighs> Infinitely finite, wow, that's a new one. This always lets you count all the elements in any array of this type. Now, if you can count all the, if you count all the, 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 the digits in this array, then you certainly can count the number of sequences in this array. And then, <sighs> I'm not even gonna address that either. I would just uh, elaborate up a, a, a little further. Uh, what, what I'm saying is, is that if you have a, a collection of sets and you have elements in this set, in this set, in this set, this set, and this set. Perhaps you can't directly count the number of sets you have, but if you can count the number of elements or in each set, then you certainly can count the, the number of sets that you have. Oh, God. No, you can't. Oh, my God. So, <laughs> I, I, there's no point in addressing that. I, I've already explained everything here. That's so, so basically, what I have shown that is that Cantor's diagonal argument fails that the set which we assumed was uh, uncountable is really countable. Now, I, every, every version, every attempt to show that a set is countable that I've come across invariably boils down to this argument, even though it's often couched in, in heavy-duty jargon and, and... 
Yeah, because there's a reason for th- formal arguments, because it's needed here. You need to be precise because each part of the argument is important to why the argument works, that you need an infinite length representation in order for this to actually make sense in the first place. <sighs> Highfalutin terms, pardon the expression, but if you plow through it, eventually the argument boil that, that the set is uncountable boils down to Cantor's diagonal argument, which obviously fails. No, you have not shown that. It is not. If you use the word obvious in a proof, I'm going to fail you. And I think I'm going to fail you here. I'll move that up for one second, but I'll give you time to stop it and look at it again. If you... Oh, yeah, we're done. So um, for every, every one of the 1432 people who have seen this, um, I'm sorry for your watching this because this is a terrible introduction to Cantor's diagonalization argument. I'm sorry that is just bogus. Please do not watch this video. I'm not even going to link it in the video description. You can easily find it, but please do not watch it. Um, yeah, so if you want a good introduction, uh, please put uh, your request down into the comments down below. I can do a proper introduction, but I'm sure there are many others who have done a better introduction than I ever could. Um, but the thing is that this is a terrible introduction. I'm giving this video an F because it is failing in almost every way about Cantor's diagonalization argument. It's important to get all of the details right on this one because every single part of the argument is very important to get precise and formal. Every single part of his proof here failed in some way that is not clear and it didn't make sense it, it, well i can understand the problem of his argument but anyone watching this video is going to get a false assumption about Cantor's diagonalization argument thankfully some people who uh, commented down below it looks like there's there are some comments that um tried to set him straight and the dislike ratio is certainly helpful but yeah please do not watch this so hopefully that was interesting. Leave comments about Cantor's diagonalization argument into the comments down below. As always, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. It really helps us out. There are many other links in the video description if you want to support the channel further. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. And I'm gonna go have a drink after this. That was easy. That was easy. That was easy.